for those who, anybody who wants to participate. Uh, you'll get to be a part of that. So that's the AGM at 9 in the morning. Then we'll have the regular service starting uh, at the regular time. All right. And then um, the week after that, the 13th, as a congregation, we're going to go and meet in a park. Lord willing, the, if the, the weather is, is favorable, we will meet in a park since ACT has basically opened up the door for us to meet uh, in public spaces, in the out and open. So we'll try and figure a way to have microphones and stuff, but I'm not sure if that's going to be possible in a park. So we might be doing it a cappella and uh, unplugged. But that's okay. Um, the Lord has blessed me with a loud set of lungs, and Andre and Ruth are great. And uh, I'm sure we can bring other percussion instruments and sing and dance in the park, just uh, just as the new believers did, I am sure. So the believers of the first century. So I'm looking forward to that. So that'll be on the 13th. Uh, and if that works out well, we may can we we'll just might continue that until we are able to meet in a room. I can't guarantee that for sure, uh, since I am not very good at predicting the future. <clears throat> but that being said, um, I need to start today with just a prayer. Father, I just thank you that you are the focus, Lord, of everything that we are doing. Lord, we are here to bring you glory. Lord, we are here to focus the attention onto you. We want you to be exalted. We want you to be lifted up. I want you to be happy with what you hear and see. I want our prayers, our worship, and the, even the message, Lord, to be a sweet-smelling incense to you, that it would bring glory to you, that it would bring attention to you and to what you are doing. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. All right, um, before I start my message, sometimes, you know, the Lord just drops things, and I was sent an email by the Australian Prayer Network, uh, and one of the things that they talked about today I thought was very relevant to what we're doing in our study of Revelation. So this is, uh, this, the title of this is that the Taliban sees the U.S. Afghanistan pullout as a fulfillment of Islamic end time prophecy. Um, many of you have heard me mention that I actually subscribe to an Islamic uh, final world empire, not a secular final world empire. I know many may disagree. That's okay. We can have our disagreements in those areas. But that being said, this is just something to be aware of and to keep in prayer. Here's, the, here's what this states. It says, many in the West see the U.S. pull out from Afghanistan as a geopolitical disaster and an epic tragedy for those who are left behind under Taliban rule. The Taliban and other radical Muslims see their takeover of Afghanistan not only as a military victory, but also as a fulfillment of Islamic prophecy. The Taliban's Twitter page carried the message recently that says black flags will arise from Khorashan and nothing will be able to return them. Now, Joel Richardson, uh, many of you have heard me mention his name before, Joel Richardson author of the best-selling book, The Islamic Antichrist, explained why this Islamic prophecy is so important. He says, quote, This is very important. I haven't heard about it talked about in the mainstream media at all. But if we are to look at some of the main end-time prophecies within Islam, there is a prophecy that says the armies carrying black flags will come from the area of the east, or Khorashan, said Richardson. Khorashan is an ancient land that includes modern northwest Pakistan, eastern Iran, and all of Afghanistan. It says an army will come from Khorashan carrying black flags. Then it says this, the, this is the Islamic prophecy, says that the army will come from Khorashan carrying black flags. If you see them, give them your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice, because this is the army of the Mahdi who is the vice regent of Allah. So this is one of their biggest end time prophecies. Uh, Richardson says, Sheikh Imran Hosseini, a well-known Muslim expert on Islamic prophecy, explained that the U.S. poor in Afghanistan through this prophecy in his YouTube channel. Uh, it says Afghanistan is the, he said, Afghanistan is the heart of Khorashan, said Hosseini. What is happening in Afghanistan is validating the prophecy of the prophet Muhammad. That Muslim armies uh, designed uh, or designed to come out of Afghanistan or Khorashan, no one will be able to stop them 
until it reaches Jerusalem. Okay, <clears throat> that's the prophecy, right? That is the prophecy um, that this uh, this is this guy is talking about. The prophecy says that Jerusalem will be the final goal of the army of the Mahdi when they plant their flags on the Temple Mount. Jerusalem is the barometer. Jerusalem is the epicenter. Jerusalem is the goal and Satan's target. That is where Jesus is going to return to reestablish the throne of his father David and the rule and the rule of the world from. And Satan is very well aware of that, says Richardson. While many Muslims do not subscribe, so it's not, many Muslims don't sub subscribe to this prophecy, so please be aware of that. Um, but we do need to be aware as believers that there are some that will, that do subscribe to this and hold this in very high regard. And we don't hold Islamic uh, prophecy as being inspired by God, by any means. However, it is largely inspired by Satan. The point is, this gives us a glimpse into the playbook of the devil. Muslims, many Muslims, they are aware of their own that are aware of their own prophecies. They see this as a fulfillment of Islamic prophecy, and there is power in prophecy. Uh, it is it becomes a tremendous recruiting tool. The Taliban see themselves as this army from Khorasan, and many of you may have noticed, but ISIS in in Afghanistan goes by ISIS K. They have a little K at the end of their name. You may have noticed that. That K stands for Khorasan. It's very deliberate. Given the unfolding of developments after the U.S. pullout, it is likely that Afghanistan will now be a magnet for radicalized Muslims around the world under the black flags of Khorasan. So I wanted to read that to you. It's just something to be aware of. Um, uh, that, that Afghanistan is, or the leaders of Afghanistan, the Taliban, are now calling this a fulfillment of Islamic end time prophecy. Now, Islamic end time prophecy is a, I would say, a mirror image of biblical end time prophecy. Uh, that's what's so crazy about it. Their good guys are our bad guys. Their, their savior or Mahdi is the perfect description of our Antichrist, right? Their Prophet Isa, also named Jesus, is a perfect description of the false prophet in the book of Revelation. All right. They believe Jesus is going to come back and he's going to convert all Christians and Jews to Islam by words or by force. So they do believe in the return of Jesus. The problem is their, their description of Jesus is our description of the other Messiah, the Antichrist, the other Messiah. Okay, so it's just something to be aware of. Again, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't hold any credence in, in the validity of the prophecy, but there are a lot of people that do, and that will cause them to act. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, can I get a thumbs up that you guys can hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? So our, our, our built-in microphone failed on the, uh, on the computer, so I'm using, I'm using a, a, a different microphone like a lapel. All right, so now let's go into Revelation chapter 16. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> All righty. So let's start. Revelation chapter 16, starting at verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple and from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and rumbles and clashes of thunder and a great earthquake. Excuse me. A great earthquake such as never happened since mankind has been on the earth. So mighty was the quake. Then the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. Babylon the great was remembered before God to force her to drink the cup of his wine of his furious wrath. Every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. Enormous hail, about a hundred pounds each, falls from heaven on the people. And the people cursed God because of the plague of hail. So extreme was the plague. Then one of the seven angels holding the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come, I will show you the sentencing of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. The earth's kings committed sexual immorality with her, and those who dwell on the earth got drunk with the wine of her immorality." All right, let's see. 
Oops, not sure what just happened. I think it stopped sharing. Good. Okay, <clears throat> so here's our passage, and I deliberately, uh, I deliberately went into the first part of um, chapter 17. Uh, I want to go over, we, we went over this just a little bit last week. There are many different similarities between the different sevens. Now, I just had a different, I just had a thought. I'm going to pull up a little spreadsheet that I created. <laughs> you want to talk about reading Revelation and creating spreadsheets. I tell you what, it's hard not to because there's so many details and, and spreadsheets are, are very useful for looking at a lot of different details all at the same time. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if it's going to decide to come up. There it is. All right. And I will share. And is it sharing? Okay. <clears throat> Can you guys see my screen? Okay, good. All right, so this was, my, this was my attempt to collate and look at the, the sevens. And for those of you who don't have a really big screen, I'll try and zoom in just a little. Let me, um, uh, this, is, this is being a little cantankerous. It's not as easy as, as you may think uh, to share screens. Okay, I will try and do it this way. Okay. There we go. Um, yes, I can definitely attach it to this week's email. That's not a problem. Uh, this was, but it's very, it's a very simple thing that I did. All I was trying to say is what are the similarities and what are the differences between the, the seven bowls? So you've got the seven, you've got the seven seals over here. You got the seven trumpets here, and then you've got the seven bowls right here. And so <clears throat> when we went through them, uh, we looked, we looked at all the different sevens and you know, you've got the four horsemen, and that's different from number six and seven. Uh, down here, I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. We had the interlude after the sixth seal, and we also had another interlude after the sixth trumpet. And then just before it goes into the seventh, and of course, within the seventh, within the seventh seal is all, are all the trumpets. Specifically, it talks of, of them coming, and then within the seventh uh, trumpet are all the bowls, all right? And so there's this concept that's going on through there. So when I come here, here's the, this line represents the set, all three sevens, and I look at the passage we just read. There's lightning, thunder, the largest earthquake ever, and hail that is between 35 to 45 kilograms each hailstone. That's a pretty massive hailstone. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, and we see the differences uh, there are similarities all the way across because in the seventh seal, there was actually, we had this concept of, uh, if we read in Revelation chapter eight, verse five, it says, then the angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were clashes of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and earthquakes. So that was when that was when that seventh seal was opened, you have these clashes of fire, lightning, thunder, and earthquakes, all right? Then we get to the trumpets, and it grows, right? Instead of, <clears throat> instead of just thunder, lightning, and earthquakes, now we have lightning, thunder, and heavy hail. Heavy hail is added, added in, and uh, we see this in Revelation eleven nineteen. It says, Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and clashes of thunder and an earthquake and heavy hail. And we start to see that people started to curse God because of the plague of hail in that case. All right. Now we're getting to the seventh bowl. All right. So we've seen the similarities. But what we see is that at the end of this, it, there's this growth in magnitude. Now we have the largest earthquake that mankind has ever known or has ever experienced. And we have uh, hailstones that are between 35 to 45 kilograms each. Uh, a big question is, is that an ice hailstone? Is that even possible? Or is it a meteor stone? I don't know. Hailstones, um, hailstones could be either, right? So you could... You, this is where uh, when we look at hailstones being sent down from heaven, sometimes it's mixed with fire, just like meteors coming down from heaven to earth. And um, regardless of which way we look at it, uh, it is absolutely certain that God likes to end things on with a bang. 
He likes to make a show. And at the end of each of the, the, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, he has this massive light show and huge amounts of thunder. And then he shakes the planet, right? So um, this is how God likes to end things. He, he's, uh, you know, this is he. When he shows up, this is what happens. And, and you know, there's lots of links that we can, we can go back and look of the different times when God himself appears. But almost every time you will see lightning and thunder and earthquakes and, and, and even hailstones. And you just, this is what happens when God shows up. The world itself quakes at his presence. But the first time I actually read through this passage, the thing that stuck out to me wasn't actually the lightning, the thunder and the earthquakes or even the hailstones. It was the little saying, it is done. It is done. It was that little saying, uh, and that really pointed me back to a passage in John. So in John, John chapter 19, verse 30, Yeshua is on the cross. He says, when Yeshua had tasted the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, you got to understand that John is the only male disciple. I had to add that word male in there because there were quite a few females that were there at the crucifixion, but uh, they were a little more bold than the males. But that being said, there was, he is the only one who witnessed this with his own eyes. Only one of the authors of the New Testament that witnessed this with his own eyes. So he saw and watched Yeshua say this. It is done or it is finished, giving, bowing his head and giving up his spirit. And this, this brought me back to, you know, it, it comes to the question of, well, what, what is done, Yeshua? You know, this is a big, you know, Yeshua is on the cross and every single breath is excruciating pain. Uh, it's, it, it's actually impossible to breathe out. You, are, you, are, you die from asphyxiation. Uh, and to stop yourself from dying, you have to push up on the nails that are between your feet so that you can breathe out. Okay, so, so it's a, every breath is literally precious and every word that Yeshua said when he's on the cross had to be as concise as possible. But when he says it is done, who's he really talking to? He, you know, I don't think he's talking to John. I think he's talking to the Father. I really do. What is done? And I think that when we look back at Luke chapter 22, verse 42, what we see is something very, very powerful. In Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, we have Yeshua's final prayer to the Father before he goes to the cross. And he says three different times, he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. You see, this cup, what is this cup? What does it refer to when it says, take this cup? You know, Yeshua obviously is referring, he's obviously talking to the Father, and he's obviously pr praying about the crucifixion. There's, there's no other context that makes any sense. So he's praying about what he's about to experience. But why does he refer to his upcoming crucifixion as a cup? What is this cup? You see, I think it is this cup that Yeshua finished. He drank it to its dregs. He finished it and he drank it to the point that he could say, it is done. I have drunk it to the full. Well, this, this caused me to really say, okay, when we look at a cup, what are we referring to? Who are we referring to? What, what does this cup rep represent throughout Scripture? And we've talked a little bit about this as we've gone through uh, the bowls and we've talked a little bit about this in Revelation. But I want to go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in Jeremiah 25. This is just kind of the, the way that the Lord kind of took me as I was preparing this. And I want to look at the judgments that the Lord spoke through Jeremiah. The judgments that he spoke. Now, the entire passage of Jeremiah 25, I think, applies to what we've been talking about in Revelation. This entire 
this entire scripture. Now, I recommend that you go back and read it. You'll get some really good context in there. But I'm going to break it up into some small pieces and we'll go through it slowly. First of all, let's start with verse 15. For thus says Adonai, the God of Israel, to me, Take this cup of wine of the fury of my hand and make all the nations to whom I am sending you drink it. They will drink and they will reel to and fro and be like madmen because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from Adonai's hand and I made all the nations drink to whom Adonai had sent me. All right, so here's God speaking to Jeremiah, and he says, take this cup of judgment, this cup of wine, this is the fury, this cup of wine of the fury of my hands. This is the cup of fury of God's anger against sin, against sinful nations, against wickedness, and I want you to take this and force the nations around to drink it. Force them to drink it. Now, we need to pay close attention to the nations that are specifically mentioned. I think that it applies everywhere, but I think we need to pay specific attention to what Jeremiah is told. Now, I've just got this map up here so that you can just listen as I read and, um, and see if, if some of these make sense. Here's what Jeremiah is told. First, he's told, take it to Jerusalem. This cup of fury, take it to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with its kings and princes to make them an appalling horror and a hissing, a curse as it is to this day. Take him to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, with his servants, his princes and all his people and all the mingled people, the mixed people, all the kings of the land of Uz, the land of Uz. The kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. Take him to Edom, Moab, and Ammon's children. To all the kings of Tyre, the kings of Zidon, and the kings of the coastlands across the sea to Dedan, Tima, Buzz. And all who shave the corners, referring to the shaving the corners of the beards. Now take it to all the kings of Arabia. And all the kings of the mixed people dwelling in the, in, the, in the wilderness. All the kings of Zimri. All the kings of Elam. And to all the kings of Media. Now to all the kings of the north, either far or close to one another. And to all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth. And the king Shishak will drink after them. Okay, so... Certainly this prophecy applies, as it says at the end, it applies to all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth. So absolutely, this, this prophecy applies across the world. But how much more so does it apply to the nations that are explicitly mentioned in the prophecy? What I'm saying is a lot of times when we look at prophetic statements, we have to read them in the context. They are all written from a Jerusalem-centric perspective. And if you look at this map that I have up here, and you're looking at all the nations that are mentioned, you can see that we're talking of modern-day Libya, Cush, Put, Egypt, the areas of, you know, Elam, which is, which is over in Iran. Elam is modern-day Iran. Persia and Media. Media, of course, includes Afghanistan or parts of Afghanistan, but also includes Iraq. So it's, uh, it's, it's, that, it's this area up here under the Caspian Sea that extends quite a ways. The, the land of Uz was uh, also Mesopotamia. So this is the lands of Syria and modern-day Jordan and Arabia, which is Saudi Arabia. Now, at the time when the prophecy was given, these were all separate people groups. But notice how he says tw twice that includes the mixed peoples. I don't know if you know what the, the Hebrew word for mixed is. It's actually the word Arab. So just so you know, uh, mixed peoples includes all of the people, all of the Arabs and the people in the surrounding nations. Who do not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Sorry, I'm just letting some pe more people into the meeting. So this is what Jeremiah is told. He's told to take this cup, this cup of wrath, and give it to all of these nations specifically. Now he starts with Jerusalem. I, I hope you notice that. He starts with Jerusalem. And, and a lot of times we say, we, we remember the scripture that says judgment begins with the house of God. And it absolutely does. And that this is just another way of saying that God is just and fair uh, in the way that he divvies out the punishments and the judgments that he is giving. You see, just in the same way that God has dealt with Jerusalem and with with Judah and with Israel, so also God is going to deal with all of the nations and all of the kingdoms as well. So just like Israel rejected the Lord and therefore the Lord sent them into exile, caused them to lose wars and caused them to be uh, dispersed throughout the world, so also God is going to bring judgment against all of the nations. The, the prophecy goes on to make this explicitly clear uh, in Jeremiah, and it says this in Jeremiah 25, starting at verse 29. And he says, see, I am beginning, this is the Lord talking, I am beginning to bring evil on the city where my name is called. Now, which city is that? Well, that's the city of Jerusalem. So he says, I'm beginning to bring evil on the city where my name is called. And should you go completely unpunished? You will not go unpunished, for I am summoning a sword against all of the inhabitants of the earth. It is a declaration of Adonai Sabaoth. So here we have the Lord saying, he's saying in Jeremiah's day, listen, I'm bringing, I am beginning to bring a judgment against Jerusalem and against Israel and Judah. But all of you surrounding nations, you're not going to get away with it either. This same judgment of, against sin that is coming against Jerusalem and, and the nation of Judah at that time will also come against you. There's an old preacher saying that kind of goes like this, that if Adonai does not bring judgment against America, then he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. That's an old preacher saying you won't find that in the Bible. Um, but I think we could actually reword that. Uh, and make it relevant to us and say, if Adonai does not bring judgment on Australia, then he will have to apologize to Judah and Jerusalem for the Babylonian captivity. You see, that's basically what this passage is saying, that if God doesn't bring judgment on the nations, he'll have to apologize to Israel and Judah for the judgment he has just brought on them. But God is not one who has to apologize. He is just and he is right. The judgments are well deserved. You see, then we see, just like in Revelation, there is a voice crying out of the temple and from the throne. This is the Lord's voice making a declaration of the completion of his judgment. And this is said exactly in the next few verses of Jeremiah. In the next couple of verses, starting at verse 30, we see, And therefore you are to prophesy against them all these words and say to them, Listen to what he says. Listen to what the Lord says to Jeremiah. He says, Adonai is roaring from on high, giving voice from his holy dwelling. He roars mightily over his sheepfold, and he shouts like those who tread grapes against all who dwell on the earth. A noise has come to the end of the earth, for Adonai has a dispute with the nations, and he is passing judgment on all flesh. As for the wicked, he has given them over to the sword, it is a declaration of Adonai. You know, Jeremiah continues to prophesy. He continues to say uh, that talking about the day of the Lord. You know, he says that a great storm will be stirred up from the uttermost parts of the earth and that the slain in that day will be from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth and that they will not be lamented or gathered or buried. So Adonai is calling judgment and then goes on and, and then has a specific prophecy to the shepherds, the leaders of the nations who have led their nations into wickedness. And he says, basically, listen, the nations are going to get judged. Yes, but you leaders have no excuse and you will be singled out. And uh, so there's a judgment against the shepherds as well. All of this is in this chapter 25 of Jeremiah, and I think it really does apply to what we're talking about 
in in Revelation, even uh, generally speaking, but also specifically as we come to these bowls of wrath. Now, when we get to uh, changing the topic just a little, we're getting to the specifics of the bowl. So the specifics of the seventh bowl. Now, there are two unique elements of this seventh bowl. Uh, Unique being uh, they weren't in the seventh trumpet or the seventh uh, seal. And that is the largest earthquake, quote, since mankind has been on the earth. And the second is this enormous hail. Uh, The text actually says that it is one Roman talent each, which uh, is somewhere, but we're not 100 percent sure, but it's somewhere between 65 to 100 pounds, which is somewhere between 35 to 45 kilograms each hailstone. Now, for those of us who lived through the, uh, well, they were, I don't know, between one and two kilogram hailstones that hit the ACT, uh, was it two years ago? Um, We saw the damage that that did to buildings and to cars. You can imagine, I think we we have no need to really imagine what uh, 35 to 45 kilogram hailstone would look like. Oh yeah, it's a, it's basically, we say it's a small person, it's, it would explode with the, with the weight of, uh, of a bomb. Okay, so these, these would create massive craters. And um, this earthquake though, it starts out by talking about this earthquake, okay? So this earthquake says that it's, it causes the cities of the nations to collapse, and it causes the islands to sink, or to flee away. There's this sense that the islands flee away and that there's no more mountains anymore. You see, it's for this reason and these sorts of scriptures that I am not afraid of global warming. I'm not afraid of global warming, warming the polar ice caps, melting the ice caps and causing the world to be flooded once again for two reasons. First of all, God explicitly says that he's the one who's going to sink the islands and he's the one who's going to destroy the earth. He's the one who's going to collapse every city, and he's going to do it with fire from heaven, not with a great flood. The second reason is because of the promise he made to Noah that he wouldn't destroy the world with a great flood. So there's two different things that, that, are, that I can absolutely hold to. First of all, that, um, that uh, global warming's not going to do it. God's going to do it. And that we shouldn't be worried about global warming. We should be fearing the Lord. We should fear God as nations. And um, there's not much explanation on how God does this, um, how he's going to do this massive earthquake. But, I, but I, let's just say that God has his own plans for how he is going to accomplish his own global reset. This will be the ultimate global reset. You want, you want to reset all of the wealthy nations back to the same level as all of the poor nations? Simple. Just cause all of their major cities to topple. Guaranteed that will financially cause those nations to collapse. So again, I'm not worried about uh, some rich people producing a global reset. We should actually be fearing the Lord's global reset. Okay. As for the hail, we need to remember that this is not the first time in scripture where hail has specifically been used by God to bring judgment against wicked nations. Uh, We know the story in Egypt, so there is the story in Egypt, but that's not the one that I want to go to this time. The story that I want to go to is in Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10, starting at verse 8, and you can read the whole story. This This is the story of when Joshua prayed to the Lord to have the sun and the moon stand still. This is where basically five different kings came to fight against Gibeon because of their alliance or allegiance to Israel or alliance with Israel. Uh, And Israel were bound by oath to defend them. The Lord told Joshua, don't worry, I've given, I've got this battle in my hands. I'll give them into your hands. And so he sends the nation of Israel against five different nations or five different uh, city kings. And then you get to this part. Adonai says to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will stand before before you. 
So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night from Gilgal, and Adonai threw them into confusion before Israel, defeating them with a crushing defeat at Gibeon. And they chased them by the road that goes up to Beth Horon. And they struck them as far as Azekah and Machedah. And while they were fleeing before Israel down the descent of Beth Horon, Adonai cast down great stones from heaven onto them all the way to Az Azekah, and so they died. And more of them died from the hailstones than those from B'nai Israel who were killed by the sword. Now, it's that last little bit that I love. As I say, love. I don't know if I love it or I'm amazed by it. I, I, you know, am in awe of it. That more of these Canaanite Amorite kings were killed by the hailstones than those who were struck down by Israel's swords. That is a powerful thought, a powerful thing. See, not only uh, it's, it's right after this that Joshua calls out to God to cause the sun and the moon to stand still. So not only does God answer his prayer and stop the rotation of the earth, which that in and of itself would uh, probably cause some great cataclysmic events uh, just, just in that itself. But God specifically targeted the Amorites with these hailstones such that they didn't the hailstones didn't hit the Israelite soldiers, but only hit the Amorites. And not only that, it killed more of them than all of the swords of Israel put together. And so I see this as this example where God has no problem coming up with the means and the ways of which he will use to accomplish his word. God had a word that he was bringing judgment on all of the Canaanite kings for the wickedness that they had, for their worship of Molech and for their, for their absolute rejection of him as Lord and God. And God was using Israel to bring that judgment on those nations. And this was just the beginning of the, that judgment. Later on, the author in the book of Joshua writes that there was never a day like this one before or after it, where Adonai listened to the voice of a man and Adonai fought for Israel. So basically, the Lord is going to have no problem fulfilling his word and accomplishing his word. Now, I wanted to actually end with the last couple or the first couple of verses in the next chapter first couple of verses of chapter 17 of Revelation. There's a couple of reasons why I wanted to kind of go over that chapter break. First of all, we see that John directly connects the, uh, the, the bowls with the judgment of Babylon. All right, because he tells us that one of the seven angels who is holding the bowls of wrath comes to John and gives him an explanation of what he is seeing. So we see that John understands that what he is seeing in the next two chapters, chapter 17 and 18, the judgment of, of the harlot and the judgment of the, the beast and Babylon, the sentencing of the beast and Babylon, that's all connected to these bowls. The second reason, of course, is to remind us that the chapters and verses were put in there only a thousand years ago. Uh, and so they were not in the original text. And it, I guarantee they are not in the original Greek. Uh, the Greek doesn't have punctuation, let, let alone chapters and verses. So, um, so just so you know, um, uh, it's, not, um, it's not in the original. And, and sometimes when we see a chapter, we, we get this break in our thought and we forget that the previous verse is linked to the very next verse. There is a link that is, that is there and that is supposed to be there. And so part of the reason I wanted to point that out is there's a lot of people that say, oh, the, the splitting of the city into three parts, oh, that's a splitting of Jerusalem because it's only called the great city. And we know in Revelation chapter 11, uh, verse 8, that Jerusalem is also called the great city. The problem is that by this point in the prophecy, by this point in, in uh, the book of Revelation, the entire context is the judgment of the world. We saw the judgment of Israel before, and, and that came about with the two witnesses. And we saw how those who saw the two witnesses rise from the dead 
in, worshipped the God of heaven. Okay, they worshipped the Lord and turned to the Lord in worship. However, now with the bowls of wrath, we are seeing the judgment against the world and the response of the world is to curse God and die. And that is, that is how they are responding. And so we are currently in the context of bringing judgment against the beast's empire and the capital city of the beast's empire, which is also called the great city over seven different times in the next chapter. So there's seven different times where Babylon is called the great city in the very next chapter and chapter all the way up to chapter 18. And so I'm pretty sure based upon that and based upon that context that this splitting of the great city into three parts is a splitting of the final empire's capital city. So going back to our original example. Well, let me let me just let me just gather my thoughts. So the next two chapters, they give us a detailed description really of the destruction of that city. So this is, again, why we, we, we're in the next two chapters, in chapter 17 and 18, we'll see the judgment and the sentencing of, of, uh, of this, this uh, wicked city, Babylon, and we will see its judgment. And uh, it also reminds us that God says that it is done, uh, but there's still some follow-on effects. So just because God says it is finished... There are still follow on effects. There are still effects of what God's word has just stated. And to give you an example, let's go back to our original uh, case in point, which was Yeshua. When he's on the cross, he said, it is done. And he gave up and he died. But that's not the end of the story. So we see in the case of Yeshua, yes, something was done. The judgment against, uh, against sin was fully accomplished, it was fully drunk, the, the cup of God's wrath had been fully drunk by Yeshua. And so therefore, God's plan of escape had been fully accomplished, and yet that's not the end of the story. We know that three days later, Yeshua rises from the dead to give us hope for eternal life, to validate everything that he had said, and that he's coming again. All right, so we see that the best of the story is yet to come. So even though God says it is finished, he's speaking of a very specific thing. He's talking of the judgment that is being poured out upon a sinful world and upon a sinful people. This is what has been finished, is God's judgment has been completed. And if you remember, God hid himself in the clouds of his glory until all the judgments should be complete. And so we can see that this is the finishing of all those judgments. And yet we see in the next two chapters the, the outflow of that work. And then in chapter uh, 19, we come into the second coming of Yeshua. So that is the best is yet to come. The, the glory is yet to come. So the same thing we see with Yeshua's life, we see written out through the book of Revelation. Now, the application for us today, you know, last week we covered Yeshua's warning in, in verse 15 of, of chapter 16, where it says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. How fortunate is the one who stays alert and keeps his clothes on, lest he walk around naked and see his shamefulness. This is very similar to what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 Starting at verse 11. He says this. Besides this, you know the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first came to trust. The night is almost gone and the day is near. So let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not carousing and drunkenness. Sorry, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and envy. Instead, put on the Lord Messiah Yeshua and stop making provision for the flesh for its cravings. You see, the context of this passage, if you read this, he says, listen, look, 
Uh, the hour for you to, it is now the hour for you to awaken from sleep. So this is very similar to what Yeshua is saying. Stay awake, be alert. We need to stay spiritually awake and alert at this time. We need to be aware of what is God doing in the world around us. Yes, I hear what the nation, the nations are raging and I hear the politicians screaming and they want me to be terrified of whatever they're doing. That's always the case. That's fine. But what is God doing? What, where is the Lord moving? <coughs> what is he saying? Where is he actually breathing life? Where are we seeing massive growth uh, coming to the Lord? We need to stay spiritually awake and alert. We also need to put off the works of darkness. This is what Yeshua, Yeshua terms this as, you know, you need to stay clothed. We need to put on the armor of light. So, you know, Yeshua talked about this in the beginning of Revelation where he says you need to be clothed in the clothes that he gives. We need to be clothed in the righteous works of him, the righteousness of Yeshua. We need to put off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. And I encourage you all, uh, you know, this is the same concept, the same idea as putting on the armor of God. I would encourage you that when you're going to, into work or going to speak to people, put on the armor of light. Put on God's armor. Put on God's clothing. Recognize that He is the one covering you. He's the one who makes us righteous. He's the one who clothes us. And it is in His strength that we will go. The next thing we need to be aware of is that we walk soberly, without carousing and without drunkenness. You know, this is, this is the whole point. Yeshua made this point in, in Revelation as well, that we should not be drunk we should not be getting ourselves drunk and, and uh, going, and, going and partying all the time simply to get our mind off of what is going on. But rather, we need to walk around sober. We need to walk soberly, recognizing what is happening in the world and what the Lord is doing. The next is we need to walk holy without sexual promiscuity and sensuality. I mean, this is even more important in today's day and age. You see... I understand that the world wants to make every, sin, every type of sexuality permissible, right? They want to make it accepted and permissible. Every sort of, of sexual deviation from God's sexual plan. But the reality is, is that God is very clear that sex is only, that only permitted within the marriage of a man and a woman for life. That is the permitted sphere within the covenant of marriage. And that's it. Everything outside of that is promiscuity and sensuality. And so we are called to walk holy in this day and age. We are also called to walk in peace. We are called to walk without strife and without envy. Right? This is, this is how we are to walk with one another. To walk in peace. To recognize, yes, things in the world are falling apart. But God really is in charge. And we and our lives are in his hands. We don't have to strive with one another. We do not need to be envying one another. But rather, we need to walk with each other in peace. And finally, just as a, as a summary for all of that, we need to put on the Lord Yeshua, our Messiah, because he is the perfect provision. We need to have him in us, on us, covering us, around us, surrounding us, just walking in him. That is, we are on this earth, his representatives. When we walk and when we talk to people and people say, yeah, but I can't see God. I don't know what he's like. We should be able to say to them, look at me. And then you'll get a glimpse of what Yeshua is like, because that is what the Lord is doing in our lives. Amen. Abba Father, we just thank you for your word. You are calling us to a life of holiness and a life of purity. Lord, you have given us hope uh, for the future. You have given us a joy that is un unsurpassing, that is, Lord, not based on circumstances. Uh, Lord, and we are so thankful for the, the working and the outworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Yeshua's precious name, amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to have to put my headphones.